I sometimes used to feel a great disconnect or general void of inspiration when facing the prospect of discussions surrounding the more contemporary lore in 40k. One of the reasons was that I always thought it better to allow something of a longer term picture to emerge before any reasonable analysis could be made. Of course, there are exceptions, certain revelations cannot be ignored and can demand immediate discussion. But for the longest time, this was not the case, and I still often think it is not the case. I find myself resisting the need to jump on the bandwagon of every single macro revelation or suggestion because I quite honestly prefer to allow my interests in the law to take their own path, not necessarily be entirely enslaved to the algorithmic god of YouTube. Because once stuff is out there, as in lore, the revelations will still remain. In the case of Belisarius Call, the former has been my preference, to resist discussing every avenue available around him, even though I greatly enjoy Call as a character. The possibilities and greater breadth of any intentions relevant to him were always so numerous that it seemed almost foolish to begin speculating upon them. With that in mind, before I go any further, I should mention that today we'll obviously have some spoilers that occur within the quite recently released Gene Father, and you can consider this the case from basically here on. It's hard to make any video focused around call or current events without discussion of that. And whilst I normally don't specifically mention or give warnings for such things, because firstly in my mind at this point, spoilers personally are not a thing in 40k, because I consider 40k a giant information puzzle, where the order to which things come to you doesn't matter. To me, the law of 40k is simply about arranging what revelations come about. Not to mention the fact that even in just beginning learning about 40k in a very casual way from the very beginning, you end up running into any number of what you could consider to be spoilers. I mean, think about it. At the very beginning of learning anything about 40k, you learn about what happens at the end of the heresy. Now, technically, if you were reading through the heresy series and the books which have only just released in The End and the Death, that's a complete spoiler. So for me, the whole concept of spoilers in 40k just doesn't make sense. But I know this is just a personal opinion, but you can connect onto that the fact that there isn't really any official reading order to the 40k verse. It's all over the place and in whatever order you want. I know some people have tried to create chronological reading orders or just different reading orders. Maybe I will make my own reading order one day. But the entire concept of spoilers in what is effectively a non-linear law verse is kind of silly to me. But at the end of the day, it's entirely personal opinion. People are entitled to whatever they feel. And I know that spoilers are a big thing, but I've always thought to my mind, if you're watching a law YouTube channel, you should probably brace for spoilers because <laughs> kind of the whole modus operandi. Anyway, so Gene Father is what we're talking about today. If you haven't read or already listened to it, go and do that. For everybody else, we continue. So fairly warned be thee, says I. Call Selenar Noctilith. I'll try to resist the temptation to rake over too heavily about who Call is and his intentions, because I have already spoken about Call's past before, and I recommend that you do read Belisarius Call's great work. It is one of my favourite 40k novels. But a brief summary for those who do not know. Archmagos Dominus Belisarius Call of the Adeptus Mechanicus is an extremely ancient and influential member of the Imperium. He's lived for over 10,000 years and has lived before the Imperium was the Imperium. How exactly he has sustained his life for so long is not specifically known. Call has also been memory wiped at least twice, and whilst we have some idea as to his origins, ultimately overall the big picture is a mystery. Some speculate Xenos methodology and advanced bionics sustain his life at the cost of any humanity he may have had left. His intellect is truly exceptional and is only matched by his unorthodox methods and outlook, some of which challenge the very foundational beliefs of the Mechanicus itself. And this is not something he tries to conceal, he absolutely owns the fact that he is thinking differently than many of the others in the mainstream thought of the Mechanicus. But this is the interesting thing that's different with the Mechanicus as opposed to, say, the Ecclesiarchy when it comes to humanity. Within the Mechanicus, they will argue a position 
rather than just declaring, well, you don't believe this, so you're a heretic automatically. They may still accuse them of being a heretic, which is the Mechanicus version of heresy. But when it comes to Call, he's such a powerful individual and he carries such weight in terms of his presence in the Imperium, he actually can stand his ground and say, I do this differently, what are you going to do about it? Call played a crucial role in the development of many technological innovations within the Imperium, most especially in the creation of new space moons known as the Primaris. This creation was kept secret for millennia and only revealed after the return of Rebute Gilliman. And this was when we learned that Call had long been tasked with the project at the end of the heresy by Gilliman and also instructions if Gilliman ever was to be sort of fatally wounded, which is of course what happened. One of the keys to enabling this project was the so-called Sang Primus Portum, an incredibly valuable artifact of the Imperium, because this contained the raw genetic material of not just the Primarchs, but it was in fact the basis for the entire Space Marine project. The Portum, though, was not its original form, or perhaps maybe just better to say its original designation. It was originally held by the Selenar, and said to hold the key to creation. The Selenar were an ancient gene cult who resided on Luna, having existed since possibly even before the Dark Age of Technology. They had used many names before, but whatever their title was, they always retained the same goal, to keep the power of genetic creation out of the hands of mankind. Their reasons for this, that mankind is generally horrifyingly destructive and cannot be trusted with the genetic knowledge they hold. Now this is something readily proven, because when the Emperor forcibly wages war and secures the Portum using the concentrated gene code in the Marines beyond the parameters advised by the Selenar, it pretty much makes their point. Interestingly also, despite the Emperor's history of eradicating entire cultures for lesser offences, he permitted the Selenar to retain their religious practices and relatively autonomous culture, not entirely dissimilarly to the Mechanicum. And again, it's interesting how the Emperor tends to pick and choose what he thinks he can and can't destroy from an ideological perspective. This may be something to do with the Selenar's unparalleled expertise in gene craft, surpassing even his own, and also their vast industrial facilities crucial for constructing his legions, and the fact that he needed all of this because building all of that himself would have been a lot of work and too much trouble in a very tight time frame that he was seemingly working to. In the contemporary Imperium, the Sang Primus Portum is closely guarded aboard Belisarius Corps' flagship, the Tsar Quasitor. The interesting thing for me is that the story of this genetic keystone for humanity continues right through into Genefather, because as we learn more about Fabius Bile's intentions, it's clear that his ambitions are one of the great fears that had been held by the Selenar, and are exactly why they always had wanted to prevent its exploitation. Why they couldn't have just destroyed that, I don't know. Perhaps that would have been too significant a crime as a gene cult to destroy that level of knowledge, and that they held out hope that it could have been used later, perhaps, to rebuild a more perfect culture after the Age of Strife. However, that was unfortunately not to be the case. I felt it worth mentioning though, as I do think the timeline of the Selenar, Emperor, Call and Bile all do line up in the end through a consistent story of Dark Age genetic technology. And this is often the case with 40k lore in general, I guess from what I was discussing in the beginning, while there is no specific linear timeline, you will often find that a story begins somewhere in a short novella, then it transitions into the heresy, then it transitions into some random story elsewhere about a specific character, then it transitions into a much later novel or another character extension, or perhaps even the contemporary lore that's being driven forward. So stories often connect, but just in a really random pattern. And sometimes I think that must be very difficult and frustrating because again, if you read about something in one story, imagine you're new to the lore, or even if you're fairly experienced in reading the lore of 40K, you might pick up one novel, read about this character, and then you're gonna have to really do your research to find that. The events of Genefather are extremely welcome in terms of developing things forward as I'm talking about. 
because all too often in 40k, things are left entirely unfinished. The amazing and tantalizing revelations for the Inari faction of the Eldari, for example, just left hanging. It's already been many years, and how many more will it be before we actually get to find out even anything about what is happening there? While Belisarius Call has appeared in numerous generic references as an established Imperial character, dedicated to the pursuit of knowledge above all and the technological progress of humanity in the Imperium, plus his secretive nature continuing to raise suspicions about just what he's ultimately up to, Gilliman also struggled to keep track of him. Whilst Call denied wanting to be part of the Martian leadership, his Call Inferior would very much often make the case that he wanted to be. And this is something interesting which is brought up in Gene Father, that he is perhaps uncertain about his own intentions. He's kind of wondering, is this somewhere in my subconscious? And again, this is something I actually raised before, that that is a possibility. Another problem for Call, in terms of how he connects and works within the Imperium, are his associations with Xenos, which are considered by many as heresy, and Inquisitors are often very interested in tracking him down on that basis. But considering the fact that Robote Gilliman has brought Eldari even into Imperial centres to have them aid and ally and work with them, it's perhaps not so much of a stretch that Call is interested in working with Xenos as well, especially in the specific areas that he is researching. But when it comes to Call, for one who has left such significant waves through the Imperium and its history, he has really only appeared very minimally in The Gathering Storm, Dark Imperium, his great work, this last story being the only one that was significantly focused upon him. In terms of focus, Call's own attention has been upon Noctilith, or in Low Gothic, Blackstone. And this is seemingly this natural occurring mineral strewn throughout the galaxy, and locations where it has been mined long ago were discovered by the Mechanicus. Now in M41, ever-growing numbers of tech priests experiment with its properties by setting its warp energy resonance to either channel or repel the immaterium. But Call is the ultimate expert, because while they're only beginning to understand its capabilities, those such as the Necron, specifically their Cryptex, are already masters of this material, capable of creating effects far beyond that of humanity's level of understanding. But this is something that Call is seeking to redress the balance with. So, in terms of Gene Father, we really unpack a considerable amount of just what Call is up to. Although, if you were paying attention many years ago at the fall of Cadia and some other details since, it was in fact quite plain to see what Call was focused upon. And so, Gene Father was less revelatory to me than perhaps I'd seen many others, because I wouldn't say that I had guessed correctly, as it were, but I would say that it sort of ticked a lot of boxes that I had thought were plausible. In all honesty, it's pleasing that this has been expanded upon and not twisted into some very long-winded, dragged-out, obfuscated puzzle, because really, Call's intentions were not particularly difficult to see. It was clear that his greatest task is uncovering the mysteries of Blackstone, but specifically with an intention of closing the Great Rift, the Cicatrix Maledictum. And it's this that could change everything. When Abaddon the Despoiler launched his 13th Black Crusade upon the Imperium and Materium, it was the culmination of a campaign that spanned multiple years and involved a spectrum of Chaos Space Marine warbands, demonic forces, and others aligned with the forces of Chaos Undivided. However, it was notable in its focus and achievement, for one of the central objectives of the 13th Black Crusade was to capture or destroy the fortress world of Cadia, a strategically vital location guarding the entrance to the Eye of Terror. Until the events which saw the devastating Cicatrix Maledictum tear through real space, the Eye of Terror had been the largest warp rift in the galaxy. It was a blurring of the boundary between the warp and the materium, and as such formed the primary source of chaos incursions into Imperial space. The Eye itself had been caused by the birth of Slanesh at the end of the Age of Strife, and consequently the Warp Rift was patrolled not only by the Imperium, but numerous Eldari craftworlds who also sought to minimise the incursions of Chaos, seeing this as their ultimate task in their lives essentially. Abaddon, though, had greater plans. He sought to weaken the defences of the Imperium 
and achieve a significant victory that would further destabilise it. The means by which he sought to achieve this were the Blackstone Fortresses, ancient weapons or platforms from beyond living memory, forged in the most ancient days of the galaxy, potentially by the Eldar, the Necron, or even the Old Ones. And these fortresses can function as heavily fortified bases in strategic locations, serving as staging points or defensive strongholds. Their sheer presence can be a significant influence on the balance of power in a given region, for their ancient technology and energy reserves are highly coveted by numerous factions. But one of the key features of Blackstone Fortresses is their ability to manipulate the Immaterium, the warp. They can disrupt warp travel and communications over vast distances, making them potent tools for controlling strategic regions of space. They also have the capacity to amplify psychic energies because they're forged of, as their name implies, Blackstone, that is, Noctilith. And it's this material which has become ever more important, and the Imperium in M41 has only begun to become aware of this. Although individuals have known of its power for millennia, and likely even before the age of the Imperium, when correctly influenced, Blackstone can either amplify or nullify psychic power. In the case of the fortresses, this had the potential to make them a terrifying weapon, which was likely their original purpose, given their origin from what is believed to be the War in Heaven, and given the mention of their creation by the Eldar gods in their mythology. It certainly seems like these are very likely created by the Eldar as an immense ultimate weapon in that time. So a Blackstone Fortress can become devastating weaponry, so much so it's capable of annihilating entire planets, star systems and deploying extreme levels of energy, effectively a gigantic disintegration beam and other advanced technologies designed for maximal destruction. It was through their power that Abaddon in his 13th Black Crusade utilised them along with sieges and massive fleet actions. The culmination of the campaign occurred with this fall of Cadia and the planet was shattered in a cataclysmic event known as the Cadian Gate Collapse. Abaddon driving one of the Blackstone Fortresses itself pushing it, ramming it into the planet. The aftermath of Cadia's destruction was marked by a cataclysmic event that would send shockwaves through the entire galaxy. As Cadia fell, the strategic importance of the planet became strikingly apparent, and far greater than any could have imagined. It was already known that Cadia had long served as a bulwark against the encroaching forces of the Eye of Terror, but the Imperium had always seen this as more of a literal bastion of defence, but it was of course far more, and its destruction would have era-defining consequences. Something that's very clear now is that the despoiler, something that has become very clear now is that Abaddon fully understood this, and this indeed had been the end goal of his Black Crusades. At the heart of the devastation lay those ancient Cadian pylons. These were formidable structures that had, unbeknownst to humanity, played a crucial role in holding back the destructive energies of the Immaterium, and this marked the apparent success of Abaddon's Crimson Path, his long, dark, calculated plan aimed at weakening the barriers between real space and the warp to drag the Imperium down into the darkness of chaos. The fall of Cadia the collapse of the pylons would cause this weakening of the barriers that had held back the warp, and its total failure now illustrated the profound consequences of this upon the very fabric of reality. Although difficult to establish definitively, it is believed that Cadia was the keystone, and as such its destruction marked the final lock that unleashed the Great Rift, the Cicatrix Maledictum, and this manifests as a colossal, turbulent warp rift that tore through the galaxy, dividing it into two halves effectively, creating as things stand the Imperium within the light of the Astronomicon, the Imperium Sanctus, and those on the other side of the rift, the Dark Imperium, Imperium Nihilus. Abaddon had played a very long game, one which he had masterfully concealed the ultimate goals of. His consistent crusades from the Eye of Terror had appeared to the Imperium little more than an annoyance, and often a failure, but the ignorance and the arrogance of the Imperium would ultimately prove their undoing, for the consequences that would be seen in the aftermath of the fall of Cadia fully underscored the misunderstood strategic importance of Cadia in maintaining this semblance of stability. Those such as Belisarius Call had come to understand 
that it was the destruction of the Cadian pylons that had greatly contributed to these devastating events coming to pass. Although it should be noted that there were additional factors such as sorcery by Magnus the Red, the awakening of Aeneid, massacres in the Damocles Gulf, and something often that is forgotten about, an inevitable flex of reaction by the ruinous powers, the dark gods who were actively reacting in the warp to the return, the resurrection of Rabute Gilliman. The Primarch himself would, after considerable research, begin to understand that Abaddon strategically destroyed Blackstone rich worlds over a period of 10,000 years, and that with Cadius' destruction triggering the rift, it illustrated just how critical it was to have a leader of humanity capable of connecting and relating specific events enacted by the enemies of humanity. It's entirely possible that if Gilliman had remained as the commander of the Imperium across 10,000 years, and not a bunch of squabbling bureaucrats who fight and destabilise the Imperium continuously from one millennia to the next, Abaddon may never have been able to achieve the end results of his campaign. But ultimately, the catastrophic events did divide the Imperium. It cut off entire systems, leaving them to the predations of Chaos and the Xenos. The rift significantly disrupted the laws of reality, causing time fluctuations across the galaxy, and it remains as a tainted scar in the skies of Imperial worlds. So powerful, in fact, is its presence that it can burn into the eyes of those who look upon it, even scar their flesh, and mark the newborn in unforeseen ways. As a response, Gilliman would launch the Indomitus Crusade to liberate embattled Imperial worlds and seek whatever means of reprieve or solution he could, all the while the Gods of Chaos engage in rift war throughout its chaotic expanse. Despite all of this chaos, there have also emerged additional unforeseen consequences. As some believe the rift continues to now empower the Emperor, there have been a surge of psychers born throughout the Imperium, and some even believe that the faith, the increased psychic power emanating from the rift, continues to imbue him with additional power, rouse him from this long 10,000 year sleep. And some among the faithful even believe that this could mean his eventual return to a corporeal form. Now, something some might argue that has been appropriately forgotten about, as it had limited significance, is the series known as the Psychic Awakening. This was the series of supplements that followed the Gathering Storm. I think it was best described by some as Law by Committee, as it was both individually unattributed and also contained various oddities in some of its references. It was essentially, though, a vehicle to expand our vision of what was taking place after the opening of the Great Rift in a broader context than had occurred in the Gathering Storm. And this is not entirely dissimilar to the current Crusade books such as Pariah Nexus. Nonetheless, it was the final instalment of this series that piqued my interest, and this is where we would hear the term Pariah Nexus for the first time. Although we had learned about the properties of Blackstone during the Gathering Storm, we also learned that those such as Belisarius Call and the Mechanicus were now interested in the material and were actively mining it. They were still not fully able, though, to understand its operation or significance. Call, of course, had realised that the Necrons were seemingly heavily involved or connected somehow with Blackstone and the Pylons because they were marked with their runes and symbols. When Pariah was released, we discovered these new spatial anomaly regions known as the Pariah Nexus, or the Zone of Silence. It was highlighted that the Necron were using their pylons to create a region of space devoid of warp influences, effectively a huge null field. The Nexus was an extensive black stone array, engineered by the Necrons under the guidance of Cryptek Zeras and the Nihilak dynasty. These Nexus are regarded as the epitome of Necron cosmic engineering, the core of this network residing in the Zendu system, featuring an immense Blackstone cage. Safeguarding this significant construct are numerous Necron orbitals and warships stationed around the system. Within the territory are an expanding network of vast Blackstone pylons deployed in patterns governed by fractal crypto logic that is far beyond human comprehension. Scattered across nodal and outlier systems, 
Each pylon stands as a unique colossal structure, with its purpose to sustain and expand their fields of anti-empiric energy. The Necron, of course, are aggressively anti-psychic as a race anyway. They hate everything about it, they resist everything about it. And while their inability to use the warp makes them effectively immune to its influence, this also limits their ability to combat psychers effectively, which is historically why their war with the Eldar and the Old Ones was so problematic. This fear of the warp also extends to include their tomb worlds, and so to safeguard against warp oddities, they utilise what's referred to as a null field matrix. Now this advanced and very likely blackstone based Necron technology generates a large anti-psychic field and are used to shield Necron tomb worlds from psychic interference. These are believed to have been developed during the War in Heaven, and when entering into the localised space of a tomb world, these can disrupt a psychic's connection to the warp. These matrices affect anything of the Immaterium, even demons. It's powerful anti-warp field causing them to just flicker in and out of existence, not unlike a Briar Nexus. A small adjacent note also, and a way for me to crowbar in a different speculative theory here. Interestingly, the Null Field Matrix has also proven to be detrimental to Tyranids, because remember, Tyranids are, for all their biological focus and appearance, actually a very psychically based species. They require the continual connection of a synapse and the hive mind to operate as effectively and all-consuming as they appear to humanity. However, in instances where Tyranids have been separated from the hive mind, with the exception of vanguard organisms like gene stealers and lictors which are designed to operate individually, along with some of their other higher forms, they're not operating just on instinct, the vast majority of Tyranids will revert back to basically an animalistic state of individual survival, basically just a pure raw instinct to consume and survive. Suffice to say, Unsettling their synapse connections and the hive mind is extremely detrimental and disruptive to the Tyranids. The point being, obviously the Tyranids continue to be this ever-increasing threat to the Imperium, something that as yet there is no real solution to. So it's an interesting thought that as Belisarius Call and humanity begin to uncover the power of Blackstone, it could end up using similar null protective matrices that would blanket a world and prevent it from the dangerous efficiency of the Tyranids as they devour entire systems. The considerable problem with this is that humans with their baseline psychic awareness are greatly troubled by null fields just as they are the prior nexus, and it would also inhibit their ability to communicate long distance using psychers. This effect is often referred to now as the stilling, and this stilling null effect of the nexus were first encountered by the Imperials sent to investigate the Pariah Nexus. It soon became apparent that the effect of these made warp jumps for Imperial vessels considerably, if not impossibly, difficult. Of the fleets who did investigate the anomaly first, they discovered worlds that should have been busy with human activity, local ships, vox traffic, but there was no sign of human life. They did, though, detect energy signatures pulsing from multiple Imperial worlds. The specific nature of these emanations remained undefined. And the first examples of just how devastating the Null Field's effect on humans could be were discovered as ground forces landed on those first silent worlds. The humans deployed found that their initial uncomfortability and their malaise that had been affecting them ever since entering the Prior Nexus now became far more severe. All of the symptoms that had only affected a few individuals would have been the stuff of just ordinary human life. Some paranoia, anxiety, growing lethargy, exhaustion, despair something that all who serve in the Imperium should feel periodically. Yet this was now affecting everyone, all together, simultaneously, and with every passing hour, their condition worsened. Commissars dealt with this the only way they knew how. But it soon became a horrifying parody, as summary executions reached epidemic proportions, guard soldiers simply began to abandon posts, others just sat down where they were, dull-eyed, vacant, mumbling about giving up, others collapsed, unresponsive, inert, and unwilling to move. And for any who actually possessed the powers held by Imperial Psychers, their fate was considerably more acute. Many complained of feelings of being smothered, mentally tortured as if with water, or they were continually being drowned. Others descended into states of undefined madness, or just took their own lives. 
In a very short space of time, the navigators and astropaths of the Imperial Exploratory Fleet were lacking the staff required to even exit the systems they had entered into. And this is one of the major problems of the prior Nexus. It is effectively this web which once humans travel into become trapped in this downward spiral and then just cannot leave, die, disappear. Unbelievably, even those with significant mental fortitude, such as the members of the Imperial Knight households, even Astartes themselves, began also to become affected. And for reason it's been quite difficult to define, only the battle group's Adeptus Sororitas appeared largely untouched, and that continues to be the case in contemporary references as well. But no matter the worlds they encountered, the conditions they discovered were much the same. Completely abandoned, effectively dead worlds. Ancient humans would have said ghost towns, they were completely devoid of human activity. Stilled worlds. Agri-complexes, spaceports, genitorums, refineries, mining settlements, fortifications, even entire cities stood empty. They found entire hab centres as if the people had simply up and left. Food moulding at tables, servitors inactive, dead-eyed and silent, transports, mining rigs and shuttles crashed and unrecovered, many locations saw significant damage from fires raging or plasma generators overloading. Ordinarily, these would have been contained, but with no one to do so, they consumed all they could reach. There were signs of battle too, but these were sporadic, random, often in locations that had no value or reason to have taken place at all. Billions of Imperial citizens had simply disappeared, leaving all their personal possessions and vowed duties abandoned. The outcome of this first foray into the Pariah Nexus would culminate with one Inquisitor Draxus, aided by Ephrael Stern of the Sororitas, who managed to extract data that assisted the Imperium in understanding what was happening here. But it did not help them in learning why those who carried faith in the Emperor were seemingly unaffected by the power of the Null Field. Even the Necrons themselves, including Illuminor Zeras, were unable to understand this. But despite the potentially positive applications of resisting those such as Chaos and even the Eldari that Noctilith pylons enabled, it was unfortunately equally as problematic to humans themselves other than a very minimal contingent, which therefore means most of the Imperial forces. The Necron activities were seen not as being mutually beneficial against a common enemy, but more as just another Xenos threat which had to be crushed because the Pariah Nexus was more problematic than it was beneficial. Returning though to the previous mention of Necron Null Matrices, while such a device would be very obviously problematic, we could imagine if we returned to past examples of say Inquisitor Cryptman, who thought nothing of exterminating human planets to create a firebreak of the Tyranids, it's not a significantly implausible leap to imagine that in a more speculative scenario, Imperial planets using some sort of similar device turned on at critical moments during a Tyranid assault as a means to disrupt them at an exact moment when a devastating Imperial counterattack could take place. It would be periodically disruptive and painful for humans, but humans appear to take a period of time to slip into this disconnected malaise, whereas for Tyranids any disruption to their synapse links dependent on the organism would have a far greater disrupting impact, potentially enough to turn around an entire battle or campaign. We might also imagine what if you were to say put these matrices around a system, orbital bodies like moons or even satellites, thereby potentially minimising effect on humans on a world. The problem there is that despite their effectiveness, the Necron's null matrix unsurprisingly demands immense power, and often well concealed within a tomb world to prevent, say, raiders or damage and destroying them. The technology, though, is comparable to an adjacent version of those same anti-psychic pylons on Cadia and other worlds, intended to primarily sever access to the warp. What was discovered in the first investigation into the Pariah Nexus, as the Inquisitor found, was that the Necron project was never fully completed. What is currently speculated to have happened is that the Necron Pylon project was in the process of being constructed around the time the Necrons entered into their great sleep, and that this consequently halted that project. One of the Necrons, in fact, many great projects that would stand unfinished for millions of years. Now, in the contemporary period of M41, as many Necron dynasties have begun to awaken, it appears evident that some of the Phaerons still maintain a desire to see their great Noctilith pylon project completed. Their ultimate goal they wish to achieve? The entire separation of the warp from the material galaxy, permanently. Now I've talked much about this in the past, 
and honestly, I would place these revelations into the same category as The Gathering Storm in some respects, because the fact that what is really quite a significant revelation about the entire cultural intentions of the Necron is slotted into this final page of a campaign book in the first prior as part of Psychic Awakening, and one that wasn't even particularly well received. So by the end of this series was likely not being very actively collected, and even if it were, only seen by a small percentage of the entire 40k audience, which is baffling to me because it really is quite a significant revelation. But again, this is kind of par for the course when it comes to learning 40k lore. The aforementioned contradictions, of course, also apply to the fact that during the fall of Cadia, Blackstone pylons were activated, causing the Sororitas living Saint Celestine to dim her powers and abilities, just as Psychers did. And it even mentions also those of Faith. So you can't even say, well, it was just Celestine, maybe she's different. Yet by the time of the prior nexus, the Sororitas and any of significant Faith are now 100% immune to the Nullfields effect. A bizarre, completely unexplained contradiction that has still not been addressed in any meaningful way. The relationship between Belisarius Call and Robute Gilliman is one that for the purposes of this video we do not need to dissect in an especially deep regard. It's enough to observe that they consider one another with mutual respect, and while they have their differences in many different areas, they also maintain an understood dependency grounded in their shared dedication to the overall goals of the Imperium of Mankind. Belisarius Call, as an Archmagos Dominus of the Adeptus Mechanicus, possesses a truly unparalleled level of knowledge and expertise in technology and moreover a view of research and innovation that many among the Mechanicus would and do consider heretic or heresy, including those of the Inquisition additionally. Gilliman, the Primarch of the Ultramarines and Lord Commander of the Imperium, tolerates and values Call's contributions, understanding that whatever his bizarre eccentricities, they are entirely offset by his ability to contribute significantly to the Imperial arsenal and its strategic capabilities. Call's prowess and inventions have so far been instrumental in aiding Gilliman's effort to revitalise and reinforce the Imperium during the era known as the Indomitus. It's no exaggeration to say that without Call, it may well have been impossible for Gilliman to achieve what he has, and prevent effectively the complete collapse of the Imperium during the early stages of his return. Gilliman also gives Call significant leeway that he would not extend to others. Even though Call in many respects continually irritates him, he understands it's necessary to tolerate the Archmagos, just as it is necessary that he tolerates the annoyance of the Ecclesiarchy. Because so far, whenever necessary, Gilliman knows that he can entrust Call with critical tasks, such as historically the creation of the Primaris Marines and all the associated developments related to that. But also since then, Call's ability to counsel and in general be at critical points of inflection within the Imperium. Still, Gilliman is also extremely cautious about Call, for he is both of the Mechanicus and a very bizarre individual who is not composed of a single consciousness, but many, and whatever he was 10,000 years ago is not the being he is within the age of Indomitus. But despite all the potential issues between them and the irritation they have toward one another, Call, often annoyed by Gilliman's very long-winded speeches of formal imperial tone, and Gilliman equally annoyed with Call's vague evasiveness, they both understand that they are working toward a shared goal in the survival and prosperity of humanity. Specifically, what they each interpret this to mean, however, is somewhat more complicated. Now though, we come to the real meat of things. What has Belisarius Call been up to? Why has he been so evasive when it comes to Rebute Gilliman? And why has he been so hyper-focused on Blackstone and the Necron? He even keeps some Necrons he has as captive guests aboard his own ship, which is a very cool thing to do, as he delights in tormenting and speaking with his Necron captives. In order to really appreciate Call's grand plan, we do need to cross over some past history, but I will aim to keep this as straightforward as possible. In both The Great Work and Gene Father, Call speaks about the Pharos. For the longest time we believed the Pharos to be a unique singular construct, 
More recently, Call has suggested that this is not in fact the case, and that like so many pieces of Xenos tech being discovered, it is of Necron origin, and that there are in fact many more. Before we get too far into that though, what is the Pharos? Or perhaps a Pharos? Well, the Pharos, like so many of the ancient structures discovered around the galaxy, is believed to be of Necron origin and designed to facilitate location finding, communication, even teleportation to desired destinations, critically all without reliance on the warp, which makes sense for the Necron. It is said to function by establishing a connection between two points in the Materium through quantum entanglement. It also maintains a secondary function similar to the Astronomicon in that it can, if necessary, aid warp travel by illuminating a desired destination. But instead of using the Astronomicon as a point of reference, the Pharos would just mark a position for you to follow. Again, a lot more straightforward and logical. Importantly though, unlike the Astronomicon, as the Pharos being of Necron design, it remains impervious to warp disturbances, and what that means is that it remains functionally unaffected by anything such as a warp storm, which is considerably advantageous if you're wanting to ignore the disruptions caused by those in the warp. You could imagine that if the Imperium had had any kind of technology similar to this, the end of the heresy could have been significantly different, because the Ultramarines would have simply been able to travel straight to the Sol system. So essentially, the Pharos is a device designed to give the Necrons a means by which to travel faster than light and communicate throughout the galaxy. The device manipulates the fundamental laws of physics to connect multiple parts of reality together, enabling FTL, creating a portal to a distant location in space that is keyed into the mind of its user. It's actually comparable to some of the other extremely advanced pieces of Necron tech, in the sense of how it sits on this completely different level of technology to anything the Imperium or even many other Xenos have. Unsurprisingly, another aspect of the Pharos is the sheer amount of power needed to operate it. And in this case, Call would discover them to be powered by Catan shards. Again, not dissimilarly to the Nexus and their pylons or indeed many pieces of Necron technology. The beacon within Mount Pharos, as we knew from the Heresy, is suggested as being only one of potentially hundreds of similar devices which form a network throughout the galaxy. One last oddity with the Pharos is that each beacon is capable of tuning into one's own state with their past emanations, and that is any such as Call who have past lives or you even reaching out to share the visions of others' lives. This seems likely to do again with the strange presence of the Catan, as we've seen with others like the Void Dragon, sharing similar mind-bending capabilities. Now the Pharos, as I said, was seen first in the Heresy. This was in the novel Unremembered Empire. And again, to keep things simple, it's enough to say that the Pharos was an alien construct discovered by exploration fleets from Ultramar during the Great Crusade. A small settlement was established, and later Gilliman would assign Astartes to oversee exploration of the Pharos to potentially utilise any benefits for Ultramar and Imperium Secundus. A battle does end up taking place between the Night Lords, Ultramarines, some others including the Dark Angels, Imperial Fists and other Imperials. Now ultimately, this ends up seeing that Pharos beacon overloaded, killing most of the Night Lords, and much later the Pharos was partially restored and Gilliman announced the construction of a larger fortress to guard the location, those being the 199th Ejida Company, who were awarded with an emblem of two crossed scythes. And I mention this because they would eventually become the Scythes of the Emperor, a chapter with a long history and who were nearly destroyed, but notably because they accompany Belisarius' call to study the Pharos. Where it was then discovered that since the heresy across 10,000 years, the Pharos, being of Necron origin, had activated its self-repair functions, and quietly the Pharos facility had rebuilt itself. Call wanted to explore the possibility that the Pharos may be some means to close the Great Rift and defeat Chaos. Ultimately, during Call's experiments, he discovered the Catan device core, a shard of Zahlash, a Catan. And that, as we know, even a small shard such as this are extraordinarily powerful. So it took a master deception from Call to trick the shard into destabilizing the device's singularity before using the Pharos to then teleport the Catan shard 
and the destabilized singularity then began to collapse, destroyed though by Imperial ships before the destabilization could create a black hole. Importantly though, Call was able to escape with the data stored within the Pharos, including the location of other Pharos and Blackstone deposits throughout the galaxy. Which brings us roundly to Call's plan, and the fact that he is only able to reach this conclusion and proposal due to this exploratory operation and connections with the Pharos. It turns out that later, when Call meets with this Council of Mechanicus representatives, he explains that he now has this exact map of ancient Necron territory. This contains the location of every tomb world, pylon world, and known deposit of Noctilith in the galaxy. Now the fact that he has this information is of itself an astonishing bounty of knowledge for Call and the Imperium, but specifically for Call because he apparently so far and clearly has no intention of sharing this with the broader Imperium, or Gilliman. The Mechanicus representatives whose help he requires, that's a different matter entirely, because Call explains that if they will aid his current plan, he can repay them with knowledge, which is effectively the singular driving force underpinning all Mechanicus and their Forge worlds. But this is a very, very interesting and controversial aspect of Call's personality, because he is effectively operating completely without any guardrails, he's acting completely autonomously without consulting with Gilliman about what he's doing or the consequences that it could have, and again, that's very Belisarius Call. It's also pretty problematic. Now as Call states the obvious thing, that since the completion of the Primaris he's moved on to understanding and unlocking these secrets of the Pylons and Noctilith. He also clarifies that what everybody has suspected since the first prior Nexus and even Gathering Storm, that these devices have held closed the Cicatrix Maledictum for millions of years, which has been my speculation from the start, but again it's not a massive jump to really make that conclusion. This rift which appears, it could potentially be a natural occurrence from the days when the warp and materium were very much overlapping, and this is suggested through the Eldar mythology, or it could also be a devastating consequence of the war in heaven, when we think about just how devastating and destructive that time was. Regardless though, the Necron pylons were designed to keep it sealed, and this seems a broad thing that we are discovering about the Necron. Call, however, does not want to use the Necron's technology. What he wants is to understand it, because as with everything, he then believes that he can improve upon it, make it his own, and then his intention to close the Cicatrix Maledictum. And this is really Call's rationalization when it comes to technology. The Mechanicus have this outlook that you cannot invent, you cannot independently create and experiment and make things off of your own imagination, your own mind. Because they believe that the Omnissiah has put all information, all technology, all designs out there already in the galaxy. And all they have to do is to find the Omnissiah's holy designs effectively. Now, Call has a slightly adjacent view. Call basically says, well, look, if all that information is out there already, then if I am looking at a piece of Xenos technology like the Necron, if I can understand it and that information, and I can use that understanding of that information, then that effectively enables me to create things, and that I could not possibly, as just a lowly mortal, create anything that would be better than what the Omnissiah has already created. Therefore, if I am creating objects and designs and things of my own, those surely must have come from the Omnissiah. So he's kind of making some connections and dots between the rationalization, the ideological outlook of the Mechanicus, that are difficult for them to really contradict, but also he's obviously making a big stretch to just enable him to do whatever he wants to. Again, it's a very Belisarius call, and it's very enjoyable, very interesting for him as a character trait, and something which really assists and pushes forward the concept of how things can develop in 40k. But the main reason Call wants to experiment with this technology is that he wants the benefits, but without the negatives. Because the problems, as we noted earlier, about null fields and the prior nexus are very problematic for humans. This is exactly why Call wants to develop their own means to counter the warp, rather than relying on understanding Necron technology. And he notes also that he even has prototypes based upon the original Archaeo Xenotech that do not adversely affect sentient beings, which again is a massive revelation that could fundamentally change the dynamic of all things 
because Call observing that he can create null field tech, but that doesn't have those negative impacts upon humans, that now brings into play my previous speculations about using this kind of stuff to counter the Tyranids by disrupting their synapses, even resisting problematic issues like the shadow in the warp. Now, to what degree or scale that could be done, who knows? But the very fact that Call is sort of looking into this is a really big deal. Call rightly notes that even if they begin using systems he has developed in a limited capability, it will have very significant impact upon Imperial efforts in numerous areas. And this also brings us to something that has not been fully thought through here. Call himself notes that this will decrease psychic occurrences and the number of humans being born with psychic abilities in terms of closing the Cicatrix Maledictum. Now, from Call's perspective, that's a good thing. But from what we have been learning about the Rift's perhaps unforeseen, maybe even unknown effects on the Emperor, it could be a different thing entirely. But again, we just don't know what is happening there. Call could potentially, with the best intentions, be sabotaging the first hope in 10,000 years that if not seeing the Emperor return, could see him at least exert more willpower or awareness once again. But Call is seemingly not at all aware or even thinking about such matters. He remains singularly focused on closing the rift and, as he says, restoring balance again. And that brings us to the next far more complicated stage of Call's great plan. Call describes how he has learned from the Pharos about an unnatural black hole designated as Caligan's Moor and that this is in fact a star which was collapsed by weaponry during the ancient war, to which we can infer as the war in heaven. The reason for Call's interest upon this region is a world which, according to the Pharos, was marked by numerous significant annotations. The Necrons designated this world as Irtanathep, and more critically, it was designated as a pylon control nexus. Call believes that this is some kind of junction world, which would coordinate and inform all the pylons, and that for this reason the world and its system was destroyed originally, and that's why he feels that this is a world which could be of great significance. But of course, what use is this to Call in the contemporary period? If it was destroyed, it's an interesting anomaly, a piece of history worth recording, but how can it help us if it occurred millions of years ago? And this is where Call references the effects of gravity upon time. Now again, I'm going to sidestep describing this all in detail, or going off into an extremely deep time travel rant. If you've seen Interstellar, you probably get it, because it's essentially this idea about time slowing under extreme gravity, temporal dilation. The planet described by Call was extremely close to the black hole's event horizon, meaning that according to Call, a second on that planet would equate to a billion years for those in what we must presume is the time as it is experienced in real space, the Materium. So the realisation here is terrifying and exciting that on this planet, those who exist there are trapped within this moment of the past. They exist within reality, but their fourth dimension is distorted to an extreme degree. Call's somewhat insane plan is to somehow travel to this world through, as he describes it, temporal manipulation, a tunnel through time and space to this frame of existence. It is his belief that here upon this world will remain a fully operational Necron Pylon center of control, and he intends to learn its secrets. Now, there are, of course, many problems with this ambitious and completely crazy plan. Firstly, the Imperium and Mechanicus directly prohibit any kind of temporal artificial manipulation. As one of the Mechanicus describes, it's one of the prime restrictions. Secondly, it sounds good on paper. Access that world, get information, leave. Except this seems to sidestep the considerable problem of travelling to a Necron world that will exist in the zenith period of their power and in what presumably remains a war footing of the war in heaven, especially considering this is a planet with logistical and strategic significance for the Necron. How would Call get around that problem? Entirely unknown. I think it's safe to say that it would be quite dangerous. And then there is the other, far more significant issue, the accuracy of entering and exiting such a time-locked system, even 
if Cole can travel to the world somehow. Whilst he's there, he will be subject to that same time dilation, which means his tunnel would need to somehow remain active and open to ensure that when he returns, he returns to the same time period exactly, and not 100,000, 1 million years either way, or any number of different time periods, which would then of course make his entire endeavour pointless, and could even lead to other problematic situations such as of course a paradox. The Mechanicus who call assembled to debate this matter are both uncertain of even attempting to make such a journey, let alone if it is even possible other than just theoretically. As one of the tech priests notes, if one had the total output of a sun to employ, such feats were possible in the age of technology. But now? Doubtful. The outlay in resources would be gargantuan. Call, of course, completely undeterred. He dismisses any temporal, ethical or moral quandaries by the rationalisation that it is they of the Imperium and Mechanicus who have undone the safeguards set in place by the ancient Necron humans in the age of technology, and even other Xenos knew to leave these pylons best alone. But in the age of the Imperium, they've been damaged or allowed to be raided by the Black Crusades. So he argues that because of this, the whole of mankind could fall to darkness, and that they are both not only culpable, but also obligated to actually do something about it. He ends with the argument that in the eyes of the machine god, there is no greater sin than that of ignorance, and that they, through their ignorance, have set upon this path. Therefore, they must now rectify the situation, given their understanding of just what has occurred and the importance of the Necron pylons. So, that is Kor's great plan. Travel to a Necron world trapped during the war in heaven, somehow secure information about the pylon network, and leave without being turned to dust by the probably quite annoyed at this moment Necron and return to the precise time of the Imperium, and then still begin the next phase of a considerably difficult plan. Now, I think I need to address the obvious here. Does this equate to time travel now being legitimised as a thing in 40k? For me, personally, I remain a no on that. Now, without relitigating it, the short version you all know is that I mostly hate time travel. I hate it when it's crowbarred into fictional narratives as just a fun thing, a way to mix something up because essentially they don't know what else to do, or a lazy way to rehash and repeat what's already been done, reboot or whatever. For the most part, it usually breaks entire narratives horribly through bad writing and badly thought through paradox situations that make no sense without bothering to define what kind of time manipulation is even occurring. Or there is of course the many worlds multiverse side of things, which whilst not time travel, is equally irritating. Because it establishes a context that in the great scheme of things, nothing that happens really ever has any real importance, because it will also be happening elsewhere an infinite number of configurations, which makes any kind of narrative you have been following sort of pointless. Now in saying all of that, I thought I would just note time-based examples that I do enjoy. Interstellar, Primer, Arrival, 12 Monkeys, 11.22.63 and Dune as well seems worthy of a mention, even though that's mostly about foresight. But while Arrival, for example, is not technically a time travel narrative either, it does deal with those similar concepts and addresses them in a grounded, very thought-provoking way. Now just for the sake also of mentioning it, I almost universally hate multiverse concepts, with the singular exception of the 2013 movie Coherence, obviously stuff like Rick and Morty as well, but if you've never seen Coherence, I highly recommend. It's actually a quite straightforward concept that becomes complex very, very quickly. It's a great movie, a great discussion piece if you want to watch it with a group of friends. Anyway, slightly sidetracked. Does Call's plan irritate me? Potentially not because I think Call's proposal here is more plausible than something say, let's just time travel and tell the Emperor Horus will betray him, or let's go and time travel and try to prevent attracting the Tyranids to us by destroying the Pharos, and so on. It's not anything like that. Call's plan doesn't necessarily even stray into the realm of creating stupid paradox situations, because he's not attempting to change anything in the past, which is a critical factor. He's simply attempting to gather information from the past and bring it back to the present, which I think is actually quite acceptable as time travel goes. 
Now, I will say also, most of the major problems occur when people are either bringing things from the future to the past or trying to change the past. That's when stuff gets weird. But if you, though, were just travelling to the past as an observer and could do so without changing anything, to me, that seems more acceptable. If you started, say, bringing back to the future things from the past, especially critical objects that may alter the past, that's where things would become problematic. But just gathering pure information? Theoretically, that's fine. It doesn't really impact or alter anything. Also, this is a very, very specific scenario. Because it's not as if Call is travelling to a world that would then go on to become important in the future. We already know that this planet is not important in the sense that it is already isolated. So even if Call travels to this place, his journey there cannot really influence the path of that world. This is why I was actually extremely happy upon reading how they have structured this plan of Call's. I think they've genuinely thought about it in terms of all of these kind of very frustrating problems when it comes to time travel. Because that planet of the Necrons exists in what is effectively a complete temporal isolation from the rest of the galaxy. It's trapped in this moment that it cannot escape from. It will never be able to interact with the rest of the galaxy and will eventually be consumed by this black hole eventually. Which means that whatever occurs there as a result of Kor's visit should not really impact anything else. And that's very critical, it's very clever, and it's actually a good way of doing anything like this. If they wanted to introduce any sort of strange time-based shenanigans, which is thankfully very actually rare for 40k, but this is by far and away one of the better options they could have chosen, because not only does it avoid potential paradox issues or any weird timeline nonsense, it also most critically does not cement time travel as some kind of easy option for others. It's not something you can just replicate whenever you want to in any kind of situations. And also on top of that, the Mechanicus, for example, will not even particularly convince that it could even be achieved at all. So this is Call's quite convoluted plan, and if he can somehow miraculously pull it off, it could actually enable him to begin constructing these human pylons as a means to close the rift, even close the eye of terror, and on a bigger picture scale, begin to develop human pariah nexus, which could defend against any psychers, the Eldar, Tyranids, even the Orcs. So this really is a plan that could potentially change everything. It is worth also briefly discussing occurrences within the Nephilim sector, which has more recently given us future revelations adjacent to those we learned about within the Psychic Awakening. With this recent Crusade supplement edition of the Pariah Nexus, this has expanded upon the developments of this Necron Nexus, whose broader implications the Imperium is only beginning to understand now. What has become apparent to us is that not only have the Necrons constructed the significant realms of Null Fields, but they have positioned them not randomly, but with careful planning and consideration, and as some have now realised, dramatically creating a ring around the entire edge of the galaxy itself. These positions are marked with symbols denoting the Silent King. So it appears that yes, the Necrons' plan had been ultimately to transform the entire galaxy into one colossal, spanning pariah nexus. One thing I do want to criticise with some of these newer supplements is that they have begun also systematically avoiding dating events. It used to be quite standard that all events in any supplementary material would be dated or at least contextualised. But there are no longer dates that allow us to construct a timeline, events that are referred to simply vaguely as occurring in the dawn of the Indomitus era. The only thing that allows us to piece together a chronology is by cross-referencing what is described with other events that took place. Admittedly, on the one hand, this actually fits somewhat into the context of the law as it stands because of the disruptions of the Cicatrix Maledictum and the difficulty in dating. But I am also certain that this is in part deliberate because there is this issue that they have run into that is increasingly problematic in describing events that then raises this fear of passing the red line that marks the end of M41 and the beginning of M42. 
I think people remember that when the Dark Imperium series first came out, it effectively explained that without stating specifically, things had moved into the next millennia, which was greatly problematic. And in fact, I believe some of the wikis still carry this as being listed as M42. Now, that did get adjusted when Gilliman came along and said, hang on a minute, we need to actually look at the dating here. And they realized that their timescales could be off by as much as 1000 years. So that enables GW to keep everything back in M41. And it's pretty obvious why they would want to do that. Because if they were to allow things to tick over into M42, it would turn the franchise from 40k into 41k. And that really warrants some kind of discussion later on another video, so I'll leave it there for now. But effectively, you see far less reference to specific dates than you would have in the past. Which, like I say, understandable in the law of things, but it also means that chronologically kind of analysing when things are happening is more problematic. But we learn overall that Call continues his Noctilith experiments, that he's begun his human versions also of null technology, and that he has instructed the creation of toroid structures. A word I had to look up because I've never heard toroid before, but I did immediately understand why they chose the phrasing toroid, because it sounds a lot more interesting in sci-fi than donut shaped, which is what it means. So Call is making these donut shaped noctilith structures which he intends to tow behind ships using grav tethers. He believes these noctilith donuts will then sustain a quantum folded architecture of energy into liminal zones between real space and the warp. If they are given a positive empiric charge he believes they can wear down the edge of the null field generated by the necrons in their pariah nexus. So this appears in line with Call's plan to develop human iterations of the technology that can be used by the Imperium, but without the detrimental effects of the Xenos tech. In the Nephilim sector, there had been a launch of multiple Imperial fleets, and these were comprised of so-called Aegis fleets tasked with connecting these stilled Imperial planets. There were also Noctilith mining vessels of the Mechanicus that Call had directed to acquire as much Blackstone as possible. The Aegis fleets steadily encountered Imperial worlds who suffered the same oppressive nexus effects. Slumped soldiers, glass-eyed, deadened battalions, abandoned districts upon the worlds. They also directly encountered the impact of Necron forces, and those same forces themselves who had inflicted these significant casualties upon them. At least three entire fleets of the Aegis were wiped out by the Necron forces, at least in the beginning. Others were forced to withdraw from the very worlds they were sent to reinforce and support. But this was just the start of things. And this is where it would become interesting, because through the Imperials' initial conflicts, it would become apparent that there was something of an internal struggle occurring within the Necron. With the return of the Silent King, some leaders of Necron dynasties do not necessarily agree with his plans. And as I discussed before, while some believe a return to mortality must be their calling, others believe the opposite to be true, that their immortal living metal form is in fact perfect. Imhotek, the Stormlord, is a powerful Faeron of the Saltak dynasty, and is an extremely powerful, competent military leader. He does not align with the Silent King, and as such intends to disrupt the Nexus and its nodal matrices, just as the Imperium is seeking to remove the Necron Nexus and replace them theoretically with something of their own design. Kaul was able to identify this rift between the Xenos during their engagements in the Sector, and sought to exploit it. He would be aided also by Inquisitor Draxus, who some may remember from Pariah previously, Draxus a recurring figure in the Pylon Nexus saga. And they are an Inquisitor who has seemingly singularly understood the situation and the implications of the Necron Pylons. She is considered a radical Inquisitor, but an expert in dealing with the Necron Xenos. Much about her though also typically remains unknown, and so she remains, as do so many Inquisitors, a figure with some suspicion. After the fall of a pylon though at the hands of the Imperials, Illuminor Zeras and the Silent King both focus their attention more overtly upon the human threats. Necron generally do not always see mortal races such as the Orc, Human and Tau as any major concern. They're little more than an irritation mostly. 
but when they specifically interrupt or destroy ancient masterworks of Necron design, the attention upon those threats becomes significantly more acute. So effectively, what you have in the Nephilim sector is this struggle of all these forces, the Imperials and the divided Necron forces. And what that means is it brings them to unleashing rarely seen weaponry that is truly world ending. The Mechanicus, who had understood the risk into entering such a region, begin releasing ancient technology that was being locked away for millennia, war machines of the Centurio Ordinatus all manner of strange tools to manipulate the fundamental forces of the galaxy. These were unheard of and unseen devices of bizarre ancient origin, like the Cyclofox Determination and Voral's Necrocastigatrix. So the Necron had seen now the surprising power wielded by the human insects, and were prepared to bring out weaponry not seen for millions of years. One Pharon Nectaric ordered the unleashing of the splintered shard of a Catan and bound its fragments into a thousand strong swarm of canoptic constructs that washed over the Imperials, dooming those who survived to lose their minds, turning on one another in an appalling vision of mindless slaughter. In an attempt to avoid complete destruction, the Mechanicus would unleash another weapon of the Omnissiah. This was a technology of ancient human power, and once unleashed, it began to swell as a silent orb of darkness. Blue and white energy danced across its surface and all were drawn into its expanse. As it continued to grow, it swallowed entire armies of both Imperial and Necron alike. And by the time it eventually blinked out of reality, it had consumed billions of organisms and forms, taking in fact one third of the planet's mass with it. The planet was left tumbling out of its orbital trajectory ravaged and destroyed. The insanity of situations such as this were repeated throughout the Nephilim subsector as the Imperials and Necron alike deployed ever more outlandish solutions to attempt to best the other. This saw entire forces reduced to little more than ashes or pools of bubbling liquid. In other instances, a bound dwarf star hurled into an intense fleet engagement, killing again billions. Across countless worlds, forces beyond human comprehension were being unleashed, and as Cole learned of this exponential insanity that was playing out, he realised he had been far too blinkered by the fascinating puzzle of the stilled worlds within the Nexus. Cole quickly attempted to shut down any further deployments of omnicile fury, yet many Magos still deployed them, blaming communication difficulties with the Nexus which was in fact far more than a plausible reasoning. The Silent King, meanwhile, had been weighing his options. Fighting against both the forces of the Stormlord and Human was proving an unbalanced situation, so he reasoned it best to first crush the Humans, then deal with Imhotek. This saw those loyal to Zarek unleashing their most powerful and sometimes unstable artefacts. Cryptex were urged to use any means necessary, no matter how devastating the collateral stellar damage, to destroy the human Imperials. Curiously, in this time the Stormlord did not seek to exploit this offensive to commit his forces to assaulting those of the Silent King. Instead, they would wait and watch and fortify their positions. Orokan, the Diviner, is also noted as having closely followed the chronomantic revelations and seen the edges of a vast causal engine begin to appear. An intellect vast and terrible set countless aspects of reality turning and meshing, and the clues led to the Scaran system, for this is where things would finally be brought to a terrifying conclusion. The Silent King brought immense forces to bear here, and while the humans often were forced to fight without reliable communications, the Necron's network of pylons enabled coordinated deployments, so facing a powerful fleet of multiple Necron dynasties, the Imperials unleashed again everything they had, including many more of the bizarre weaponry of the Magi. Chronophagic weapons, phosphor chem warheads, eventually the Magos, driven to a state of desperation and paranoia, would unleash from deep in the void 25 satellites from the Dark Age of Technology. For whatever reason, whispers in the cortex of the Magos also bid these devices to disable their safety regulators so as to coax them into operation. These Dark Age satellites position themselves into an alignment thousands of miles across, seemingly operating 
without input. And when they fired, the scale of energy unleashed carved directly through a tomb ship and four Imperial war vessels. Shielding and defences seemed completely meaningless. Then the strange constellation of drones repositioned themselves and fired again. More ships on both sides were cut to pieces by the incomprehensible powers unleashed by ancient human design. They continued to reposition and fire again and again until the space of the conflict zone was turned to nothing more than a vast ship graveyard filled with shattered, burning hulks. Once again, the combat theatre of the Nexus descended into panicked chaos. Some sought to flee, others capitalise on the confusion to engage their enemies. Finally, though, an unexpected and bizarre convulsion began to occur in the fabric of reality itself. It would appear that whatever encouraged the removal of safety features on these Dark Age weapons now came to fruition, as an impossible anomaly in space tore through into reality. The Dark Age satellites eventually began to detonate, and each unleashed explosions that swirled into the void and the vortex. Something bore through into real space, tearing through despite the presence of the Necron pylons. It was a shockwave of warp corruption itself, and a planetary body, a dark star, poured through the distortion. Wormwood, the planet, the demon world of Vashtor, the Archiphane. Overall, Belisarius Call has, of course, the best intentions. He wants to close the rift, remove the threat posed by the Necron's pylon nexus and their extremely disruptive null field technology, which is all well and good. The problem with this is that in a very cool fashion, he thinks that he and no one else is capable of achieving what he seeks to. And I think this is also coupled with a fairly healthy helping of Call wanting to demonstrate and prove that he is the only one capable of doing so. The only problem with that is, Call has a habit of acting entirely on his own accord, without fully communicating his intentions with those such as Gilliman or even the wide Mechanicus. Now, we would like to think that Call is infallible, but as we've seen time and again, this is not the case, which is very problematic when your general attitude toward things is, only I can handle this. And we shouldn't worry about the quite significant consequences should things go wrong. On top of this, the fact that Call is not very likely to have been paying attention to the current affairs of the Ecclesiarchy, what's happening on Terra, or the revelations that have been rumoured and whispered, and that Inquisitors are continually investigating, all to do with the emergence of more psychers and the empowered awakening of the Emperor, something indeed stirs. We have no understanding of what this could ultimately mean, and also this is without me cross-referencing multiple other narratives that have characters poised to impact or influence developments in the era Indomitus. It's very complicated. Still, if Call's ultimate plan did come to fruition, if he were able to travel to the trapped Necron world, learn the secrets of the pylons and Nexus technology, develop human versions with the same power, but without those negative effects, if he could close the Rift or even the Eye of Terror, this would most certainly be constructive for the Imperium in one respect, the material sense, the humanity of practical physical real space. But it would be bad for Psychers, the ethereal spiritual side of humanity, and generally the Imperium. At this point though, I think it's worth noting we just do not know which is the best path forward. While it doesn't immediately appear to be the case, it could well be that in the greater picture, if the rift persists and this does end up being more valuable to the Emperor, it could be a surprising positive, at least in the shorter term, for Call effectively to fail. But there are just a considerable amount of unknown quantities, which importantly could have very significant consequences on this grander picture of things. Plus, of course, we're only thinking of binary outcomes, success or failure for Call. What if he was only partially successful, or his mission to the Necron world a disaster? What then? Then we have the emergence of Vashtor, poor Vashtor. Certainly an interesting development, and arguably it's good that he is getting some additional embellishment that appears as if it will continue on through this series. And it may also be indicative of where things are going. I know there have long been rumours this year that there may be Dark Mechanicum on the horizon, but beyond that, very little is currently explained as to what Vashtor is doing here. Beyond an obvious interest for himself, 
in the technology and the exploitation of the Necron pylons, which for someone known for being the master of demon engines should be terrifying to all. We have also the Silent King and the Stormlord, which of course interesting to us as well, but they're not the focus for today. They clearly have their own priorities and considerable concerns as to both their own internal ongoing conflict and maintaining Necron control over the Pylon Nexus, now made ever more complicated by the appearance of Vashtor. In previous explorations of the Necron Nexus, things were a considerably more neutral exploratory status, comparative to the extremely aggressive developments now seen in the Nephilim sector, which is fast becoming one of the most destructive and terrifying conflicts in the entire galaxy. And the Imperium and Necron seem to be unrelenting in their aggression to control resources and further their goals, to say nothing of the Stormlord. For Call, I think it's a particularly interesting situation, not just because of the implications of what he's doing, but also for him as a character. Because in the Nexus, he has in fact, at least initially, lost control of this situation, in regard to marshalling his own forces. Worse, in the broader scheme now, he's also lost control of the genetic material of the Primaris, and indeed the foundational genetics of the Astartes, both of which are something one might imagine that Robute Gilliman would not be best pleased with, but I'll speak to that more in a moment. In some respects, it's disappointing to see Call's character walk into these disastrous situations. On the other hand, it feels actually fair that his brazen arrogance comes back around and we see that despite all of his bravado and boasting and showmanship, he is in fact entirely fallible. And also, me being a fan of Call as a character, I think it's very necessary because he really was starting to become a figure who seemed to never carry any risk of loss, win every argument, win every engagement, and that has now been firmly put to rest, and that was necessary. But it's not about just his personal failings, it's also his inability here to control the Magi, the Magos, who under his command had unleashed horrifying weaponry from the Dark Age of Technology. Still, his prototypes of these liminal abrasures were showing some promise, and his securement of data regarding the pylons and his plans there were potentially massive game changers. So not everything is lost just yet. Now I have very deliberately not made specific mentions nor overly speculated upon the other revelations of Gene Father, which comes at the very end of the story, where we see Fabius Bile successfully secure genetic material but not technically the Sang Primus Portum, but it's as good as. I didn't want to speak too heavily to this today because it's too big of a subject to place into this video. I wanted here today to focus on Call and the general situation, his knowledge, his plan and so forth. Now, do I think that we will have a separate discussion where we explore both Fabius Bile and his recent encounter with Call and what that means for the traitor marines in the Imperium? Very obviously, yes. But I won't leave things hanging entirely needlessly just today though, because let's be real, speed of follow-up is not my strongest trait. So in a very condensed version, my ultimate takeaway is that while devastating, I don't believe that we will see Bile go out and instantaneously create Chaos Primaris. Much as people's fears of firstborn marines instantly going extinct did not really come to pass, I think everybody knew some sort of version like that would eventually happen. But anything in and around that area really is another conversation in and of itself. But what I do think is that although it's a strong possibility, whatever further developments come from this, Bio himself seems to have an alternate plan. He has his own outlook for the galaxy and that is also explored in Gene Father. He is not subservient to the despoiler or really anyone, which I think is something people often easily forget when it comes to chaos. Those who are the traitors often have very selfish, very individually focused outlooks, and they do not necessarily align with some grand unified chaos force or ideology. Bile will probably end up experimenting also for a good long while before we see anything anyway. None of that takes away from the fact that it's still undoubtedly a devastating situation and revelation, but the eventual outcome of it or even when we may see it become visible, remains entirely unknown. It could not happen for a long time. What I think is fair to say 
is that what has taken place and what continues to evolve is that just like Call and his plans related to the Necron technology, Fabius Bile could also potentially reshape the entire conflict between Chaos and the Imperium. And when we look at the greater picture of the 40k galaxy in the Indomitus era, we are most certainly into very dark and uncharted waters. <laughs>